Welcome, everyone. Um, you've joined us for a webinar, Young Children with FASD, Strengths and Challenges. Uh, and we're very excited to give this offering to you today. Um, it's, a, it's a great topic and nice to see so many people interested in supporting young children uh, to be successful. So thank you for uh, joining in. My name is Bev Drew and I work uh, at the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute in FASD prevention. And I also do training in motivational interviewing. And Marlene, would you introduce yourself? Hello everyone, I am Marlene Dre and I am the other FASD prevention program coordinator at the Saskatchewan Prevention Institute. And I am very pleased to see the, the great interest in today's session. So welcome everyone. Thank you. Um, I'll just uh, start off by saying just a couple words about the Institute in case you don't know us. Uh, the Prevention Institute has been around since 1980 and our mission is really to reduce the occurrence of disabling conditions in children. And we do that through a variety of ways. So FASD prevention is one way. The other exciting thing is that the Institute has recently created an early childhood team, which we're a part of. And uh, this team is meant to pull all the experts we have within our uh, organization together and offer some things to Saskatchewan service providers that will really enhance early childhood development. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll share more information about that uh, and you can check that out on our website as well. Um, you have been emailed a virtual booklet uh, called Understanding FASD. So that is a, a much more in-depth look at some of the pieces that we're going to present today, as well as many other parts about FASD. So um, I think you'll uh, appreciate looking through that booklet and you may order a physical copy if you want through our website. We are recording this session so that people who aren't able to join us will uh, also benefit from, from watching it as a recording. Uh, we would like everyone to keep their microphones on mute, please. Um, if you have any questions or comments, use the chat box and we will uh, attempt to respond occasionally to uh, questions or chats. Um, and of course, we would really like to acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 territory here in Saskatoon and the homeland of the Métis. Um, so without further ado, um, Marlene, maybe you could advance the slide for us. Um, we're assuming most people have some information about FASD and know a little bit about it. Um, but just very, very briefly, um, it's a common neurodevelopmental disorder um, in Canada and around the world um, caused when a growing fetus um, is exposed to alcohol. About 4% of Canadians uh, likely have FASD. This is based on uh, research. And many would be undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. So many would go through life without really understanding what it is that they struggle with. Um, someone with FASD would have a range of abilities and a range of disabilities and struggles, uh, and also a range of IQ. Um, so many are normal and above average IQ. And someone with FASD can look like everybody else. Um, only about 10% of um, people affected by FASD will have that face that everyone thinks about in terms of FASD. And because alcohol is used in different parts of the pregnancy and at different uh, levels and amounts, um, the impact is different for every child born with FASD. So each, ch each child is unique, just as you and I are. Um, so it's um, definitely um, not something you can just put your finger on and say, oh, that, that person has FASD. Um, so next slide, Marlene. Um, I see still lots of people coming in, that's awesome. Um, so we know uh, for a fact that children with FASD 
have many strengths. And this is a big list, lots of words on the page. And really what we're trying to communicate here is that um, children with FASD and adults with FASD absolutely have many strengths. This isn't a list that you could say, you could tag on one person and say, yes, they have all of these, but it's a, a good list uh, based on um, research and based on what um, interventionists have learned about uh, children with FASD. And, and it's anything. a pretty good you? you can hear it. <laughs> I can't hear anything. I can hear your voice. Could, oh. Yeah, could you please mute your microphone? Thank you. Um, if you have any trouble with, um, with anything, put a message in the chat box and we'll see what, what we can do to help. Um, so uh, we do know this is a complex situation. People with FASD absolutely have strengths. And when we focus on their strengths and build them up and use them to provide um, learning and to provide development, um, it makes it um, even stronger for that person. Like there, there's more chance of success when we use their strengths. So we're not gonna talk about all of these in, in any stretch, but uh, typically, for example, uh, someone with FASD will have really strong verbal skills. They'll be able to talk with you uh, and, and have that conversation quite readily. Um, they can express themselves. They can um, really uh, have a rich conversation. That doesn't mean that they understand everything, perhaps. Um, and it might mean that um, what they are hearing and, and taking in and trying to interpret might also get muddled. Um, but that is a typical, um, a typical strength. They're also typically very determined and, and hardworking. If you think about all the times that they um, would kind of fall down and fail, you know, uh, bump into some, some issues and problems, um, that takes a great deal of determination to stand back up again and, and try that once more, right? Um, so they, they do work hard and they're very determined to be successful. Um, and, and as I said before, they're often very bright, um, average or above average intelligence. So there, there are some things that uh, they really shine in. Um, and they can learn in multiple ways. Um, just as we can, sometimes you're a, you're a visual learner and you have to see things. Sometimes you're a tactile and you have to touch things or move. Um, so children with FASD um, can learn in many ways. Oftentimes they benefit from a hands-on approach uh, where they, um, they can touch things, they can do something. Um, you know, someone shows them how and they can copy it. And, and often it's even better if it's in relationship. So uh, a parent or a teacher or uh, another child who's showing them something, um, when it's connected to someone, it, it's oftentimes better. Um, they can also um, remember things and memorize things when they're able to incorporate strategies that work specifically for them. So maybe it's by singing a song or by marching in time, you know, um, th there's many ways that that, that might happen. So they're, they can absolutely um, remember and memorize things, but it might have to be in a different way than you might do with other children. Um, so that's just highlighting a few, and I think uh, we'll move on um, to the next slide. Marlene, I see you're still trying to support some people. Is that right? Yes. Um, yeah, no problem. I'll just carry no, on. It seems to be okay. Um, what I'm just going to add to what you said, Bev, and you may have mentioned this, and I might have missed it as trying to help people, but uh, during this webinar too, you could think about somebody that you know or that you're working or whom you're working with who you suspect may 
be living with prenatal alcohol exposure. And um, just think about that child as we're going through some of this and uh, see what might maybe be applicable or might be something that could be a support for that child. And of course, always start with thinking about what would be that child or adult strengths. Yeah. And of course, children with FASD are born with some struggles, um, otherwise known as primary disabilities. So something you're born with. And, and they're born with struggles because alcohol has an impact on, on the cells in the body, the brain, uh, different parts of the body. It's a permanent change and, and can't be just changed and fixed later. Um, there's definitely many things to do to in, improve it and make it better, um, but it's there for life. Um, all children, no matter where they come from, want to and can learn and grow. And children with FASD can do that as well. No one wants to fail. No child wants to fail. They want to be successful. And they can be. Um, when we don't recognize a child's struggles um, and provide the appropriate support or programs, um, that's when they can really experience um, struggles and, and the adverse outcomes that, that follow. Um, the areas of functioning that can be impacted, certainly the thinking, the remembering, all those cognitive skills, um, behavioral, so actions and reactions, how they, how they behave to something going on around them, and, and certainly physical. Um, we know that organs, uh, the skeletal system, the muscular system, all, all that motor development can, can also be impacted and their sensory system. So they may have heightened senses or they may have reduced senses. It can go either way. Um, next slide, Marlene. Okay, and I think I can join the webinar now. Excellent. Why don't okay. you take over this one? Okay. Um, <laughs> This slide was taken from information in a booklet which is listed at the end. Uh, Dorothy Baudry and uh, uh, a, a co-writer whose last name is Hickey, I'm sorry, I'm not remembering the person's first name, but they provided just a brief little bit of information about challenges that you may see uh, in children impacted by prenatal alcohol exposure and they put it in by age. And so you may just find that this might kind of ring a few bells or just give you some ideas. So from birth to the age of two, they may experience things such as sensory issues. And the really bizarre thing about FASD is that it can be heightened or it might be lowered. Every child is different. So if a child's experiencing sensory issues, it might be the child does not like, you know, touch, light or sound. But then another child who is experiencing sensory issues may really enjoy touch uh, like bright lights and thrive in a noisy atmosphere. So it, it makes it hard when we're thinking about sensory issues to remember it can be on either side of heightened sensory or lowered sensory. You may see children who are having failure to thrive. They're having problems with their feeding um, the infants may have trouble with their sucking reflexes. Um, they may not necessarily know when they're full because of sensory issues. So they have problems with um, feeding, maybe too much, too little. Emotional regulation. When we're starting to expect a, a child in that very early age to start being able to maybe have some ideas or control some of their um, emotions, they're not able to do that. Sleeping patterns, perhaps the child is sleeping a lot or perhaps the infant is awake all the time. And so that can be quite a challenge. And in fact, even though it's not mentioned uh, throughout all of the different ages, sleeping patterns are very significant in children with FASD. So you may have children that you're working with who you may think that they are super hyper because they are just a hyper child, but it may actually be a reflection of sleeping challenges that they're having at home. So taking a look at sleeping 
is really important when thinking about children all the way through. You may also notice that the child is missing major developmental milestones that other people are taking or have been achieving. Uh, with the age of three to five, they're having some impacts in their learning and understanding language. Perhaps they're speaking really well, but they're not necessarily understanding what they're being told. They're easily overstimulated. They have problems with making changes, transitions. Um, their behaviors may be seen as oppositional when you're asking them to do something, which it's not necessarily oppositional. It may be something related to the disability itself. Perhaps they're not comprehending. They need more time to transition. And uh, we threw in the ages of five to 10, even though we primarily concentrate on the preschool ages in the work that we do. But you may notice that the child is struggling in school, having problems with attention, uh, behaviors may be um, not what one would expect. They're having difficulty planning and following the routines once again, the major sleep problems, they're having major sensory issues. They might be totally distracted by somebody's tapping pencil uh, two desks away. Um, they're very sensitive to the environment. Are there too many smells? Um, it could be somebody's you know, scented perfume or chewing gum. And they can also be easily influenced by peers. So what are things that can help as we're noticing uh, children who are experiencing or demonstrating some of these impacts? One of the things that is a major impact for children, a major um, support is a stable home. And we know that many children with FASD, unfortunately, don't have the most stable of home lives. If they're in the foster care system, they may be moving from house to house. But giving them stability in whatever way you can, even if you know it's a foster child who's moved around a lot and you're in preschool or school, give them as much stability as you can in what you're doing. Early intervention, referring them to occupational therapy, speech therapy, um, take access of all of the supports that you can. You can also get the children to try to show you what is it you like? What is it you don't like? Because they also sometimes can be, well, they're living it. They're the experts and can tell you what may be working for them or may not, may not be working for them. So dismaturity is a, a concept that's um, definitely a piece of FASD. Um, oftentimes, a child who might be five years old uh, chronologically is maybe two years old developmentally in some areas, maybe not all areas, but some. Um, so, you know, here's some, some nice examples just to, to make it fit with maybe what you experience, you know, a child who can go to school for a full day and, and succeed and thrive, while maybe a child with FASD needs a nap or a rest somewhere in there so that they can sort of gather themselves again and, and refocus. Um, and so they struggle being successful in a full day program without some kind of rest. And there's other examples there too. I don't necessarily have to uh, go through them all, but you know, the last one, for example, a child of five is capable and, and very successfully will take turns with another child. They can play a game. Um, and someone who's functioning more like a two-year-old um, might be more about self, right? And, and not see the other person's opinion or not give them a turn. So it becomes a difficult um, interaction at that point if, uh, if they're not able to take turns. So thinking differently about children's development can be very helpful for the child. Um, if they're not functioning like a five-year-old and all the adults are expecting them to, that sets them up for struggles. So that, that's just a, a way to really think about it more. And when children misbehave, it, it's not really deliberate misbehavior. What it is, is, is communication. Behavior is communication. It might be a child's way of saying, oh, I like this, I want more. Or, you know, I've had enough, get away from me. That's enough, right? Um, or I'm, I'm hot, I'm hungry. 
um, I can't take this noise, right? So they're communicating to you when they misbehave in quotes. Okay, Marlene. All right. So now what we're going to do, having given that introduction about uh, strengths and challenges is we're going to move into a really quick overview introduction of some of the challenges in specific areas of functioning that children with FASD may experience. And we're starting off with executive functioning. And we're starting off with that because executive functioning is like um, being the CEO or the manager of an organization. It's a set of cognitive abilities that control and they regulate all of the other abilities and behaviors. So if one can understand that there are some problems with the executive functioning, then maybe it can help one understand that what the child is dealing with is a little broader than perhaps this one little language, well not little, but this language issue or a behavior issue or something else. So, and the other thing that you may notice is that a child will have inconsistent behaviors. So a child may learn how to um, maybe tie tie the laces, tie their shoes one day, and they maybe do it the next day and okay, success, you know, we are ready to move on to the next task that we want to learn. But then three days later, the child cannot tie the shoes. And that can be frustrating for the child, it can also be frustrating for you, because you're thinking, okay, we've gone through this, you've learned it, you should be able to do it. But the child can't. And that's not necessarily because the child is choosing not to do it. It's because of the impact of the prenatal alcohol exposure and it creates an inconsistency. It would almost be like the um, child is given this you know, piece of memory information and whereby uh, say a typically developing child might be filing it in say, if we imagined a filing cabinet in the brain, a nicely organized filing cabinet and where we would know where to go back and find that piece of information. The child with FASD, um, the filing cabinet in their brain may not be as organized as um, say a typically developing child. So the piece of information is there, but it's not always readily accessible. And so that's one of the major challenges children, teachers, parents can experience is this inconsistency. And because of the challenges with executive functioning too, you may notice that a child may not be understanding or learning from mistakes that have happened. Child may not uh, respond to the, tip, uh, the reward systems that many people will use. You know, if you do this thing successfully five times, you get a star. Well, that's not necessarily going to work with a child with FASD because of the impact on executive functioning. They can have trouble with their judgment. They may not understand that a stranger, um, you know, you can't go up and hug everybody. Uh, you need to learn social skills. You need to learn about, you know, being a little bit more uh, cautious around strangers. They may have trouble staying organized. They may have trouble making decisions, understanding ownership. And that's where you may have children who people will say, well, this child is a thief. This child constantly steals. It's not necessarily that. The executive functioning, the child is not necessarily understanding that this particular um, book belongs to Jane. And the child sees the book, the child needs to use the book, so the child takes the book. It's because the executive functioning hasn't taken all of the pieces of information that have you know, come to that part of the brain that controls executive functioning and helps the child make decisions. Because the executive can Functioning takes all the information that's coming into the brain and it helps the child make decisions and do planning and do so many of the other things that we expect of children. Ev, you can give us some assistance now, please. Yes. So some accommodations you can make or strategies you can implement to support a child who's struggling with executive functioning issues um, is consistency is, is first off that consistent routine so that they will come to expect that, oh yes, when I get to daycare or when I get to school, here's what happens first and here's what happens next. And you can improve that as well by having a visual um, 
image that really represents that schedule. So the child can look and see, oh yes, this first, then that. Um, so that routine, and of course routines never work the same every day. There's always, you know, something pops up. So being flexible and being aware that when this child's routine is interrupted or changed, I need to be nearby to support them, right? So realizing that that will be tough for some kids. Repetition is so important. Marlene gave the good example of, you know, putting the shoes on and, and tying laces. Um, you know, even if it's a Velcro strap, whatever it is, um, repeating and letting them learn that over and over and over is really essential. Children need that repetition. Any child needs that repetition. Children with FASD need many more repetitions to really let that become a habit for them and, and a successful task. Um, I mentioned visuals. You can use visuals in so many ways. You know, you've got an area of your room where it's a small place. So putting a visual with two children that really limits the children in that space to two helps everyone to succeed and especially a child with FASD. You might still need to support them to follow through, um, but it, it will eventually get to the place where they'll they'll want to follow that rule, right? It's a it's a good rule. Um, using using strategies where kids get to touch and do and interact with things is always um, the best way to help them learn. So it, it sort of kicks in that executive functioning when um, you're trying to teach a concept and they get to really experience, they get to touch it, they get to explore, um, that, that will be a, a great benefit to children with FASD. And for some children, their bodies really struggle to slow down, to work on a task and learn. So perhaps for the right, for certain children, making sure they get to do some physical work before you expect some quiet work or some concentration can really make a difference, right? Let them get all that energy out, let them wiggle their bodies and, and move, maybe a, a run around outside, and then they'll be able to concentrate. Um, using fidgets can be incredibly beneficial. Uh, fidget toys, um, weighted blankets or, or toys that really provide a little bit of pressure for a child, for, the, for certain children can really support their ability to calm down and, and kind of focus. Um, so that can be helpful. And of course, understanding their strengths. What are they good at? What do they love? You know, if they're crazy about dinosaurs and you're trying to teach counting, well, let's get all the dinosaurs out and count them, right? As with any child. And you really want to support them to control those impulses that they have trouble controlling. So really being there for them, maybe holding their hand when you know, um, you know, there's a fire drill in the building, and there's going to be that horrible noise, you know, um, knowing that you need to be right with that child holding their hand, maybe helping them hold their hands over their ears, you know, whatever it is. Um, to get them through that. So lots of strategies, and those are just a few. Uh, the pictures you see here are, are pretty sensible. This child um, that's working at the desk, I don't know if you can see it, but he's sitting on a great big ball rather than a chair. Um, and there are some examples of uh, the smallest picture. Those are chairs that wobble and you have to really engage your core to sit on them. And so for some children, uh, those chairs can be very helpful. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably enough, Marlene. That's Carry on. Really yeah, thank you very much, Beth. Uh, just one thing I'm going to add to that, you had talked about allow physical exercise before uh, quiet work. A lot of children, because of the sensory challenges, you know, have the, I don't know, the wiggles, um, they have that need to move. So one of the 
biggest negative impacts that there can be for a child uh, with FASD is if um, they're being, say, disciplined because of a, you know, an incident or whatever, or they're dealing with the consequence of the incident and <clears throat> their physical exercise, the chance to go out for recess, the chance to go to gym is taken away from them. They need, so many of those children need the ability to wear off the energy, or it may be one thing that they just happen to be amazing at and that it's taken away. So yes. taking away the option of physical exercise and movement is not the best, um, yeah. not necessarily recommended when children are having challenges. So information processing is the next challenge we wanted to quick, briefly introduce. So the brain is a very complicated information processing system. So we have to use our senses to take in information, turn it into signals, understand it, figure out what to do. And all of this happens typically very quickly. Well, for someone who's dealing with prenatal alcohol exposure, it's not that easy. Because of the impacts that have occurred, it can be more difficult for messages to go throughout the brain. And it's kind of like traveling, like say, um, say Bev and I, you know, our brains may be functioning differently. Um, Bev's brain is just like, it's smooth. It's like a, you know, a four lane highway, things move quickly. And the way that the messages move throughout my brain may be more like the, um, you know, the grid road out in the country where there can be some potholes and there's a lot of gravel and whether or not the gravel's there or not there. So the message is moving, but it's moving more slowly. Uh, that communication is taking place more slowly, in which case it's really a benefit for a child if you can slow down the information that's being um, given to the child. And it takes a lot of energy for children to process the information as well. So that's where you see the child is talking well, uh, can even maybe um, say back to you all of the information you just given to the child. But the question is, has the child really processed the information and understood that? The child can't necessarily predict outcomes. If I do this, this is going to happen. Once again, challenges with making decisions. The child might have a, a meltdown because there is so much information coming at the child and there can be other things happening and the child's just reached the point where the child cannot cope anymore. And something to always keep in mind with uh, behavior, it's a form of communication. It's a form of saying something is not right. You know, we need to step back and find out what is the child communicating. And also the child may have trouble generalizing something. I may learn that I cannot cross the road. I cannot just run across the road without looking to see if there are any vehicles coming. And I might learn that in my daycare location where I know, okay, I cannot cross the road if I haven't looked both ways. But when I go back to say, I go to my friend's house, um, I'm not necessarily able to generalize that information that if I'm going to cross the street from my, at my friend's house, I have to look both ways because I've learned it in one specific location, but my brain, the information processing hasn't allowed me to take that information and use it in another place. So it becomes, once again, inconsistent, uh, can't predict outcomes, may misunderstand people. So they need more time to challenge or they need more time to process information, come up with the response. And Bev's going to talk a little bit more about information processing. Yeah, so some strategies to use. Uh, first of all, our communication is key. Uh, we need to be aware of how we're giving directions, what we're saying, what words we're choosing. Um, so speaking clearly, speaking calmly, saying exactly what you mean. Um, another really good strategy in terms of communication is to say it positively. So for example, um, if a child is running inside, say walking feet inside or, or walk inside, you know, whatever you decide to say, but you're saying what you expect of them rather than don't run um, because then the last thing they hear is run and they may not process that as don't run. <laughs> so walk, 
is is more chance of success plus it's just a calmer way of of approaching that that issue um so being aware of our language for sure um Distractions are the thing that will derail information processing very quickly. So what distractions are around the child when they're working on something? Um, if it's circle time in a daycare, um, you know, are there big shelves with toys right beside them? Um, if it's time to sit at your desk, are they sitting with a whole bunch of kids in front of them that they can see and hear? Um, you know, what's out the window? So there's so many ways that um, we can all be distracted. Children with FASD um, who really struggle to process information will, will likely be more easily distracted. So how can you limit distractions in your environment? Really consider that and take a look. Um, observation is something that's really key. You know, if a, if a child is always having trouble in this one area at this certain time, get someone to sit back and really look at what's happening there. You know, what is happening right before they're upset? What are the noises? What are the, what's, what's going on, right? Could this be something we could fix easily by shifting uh, something in that environment? Another uh, good way to um, support information processing is to really check for understanding. So give a direction and then um, ask the child to show you instead of repeating what you've said. They can probably repeat what you've said, but that doesn't mean they understand it or know what to do. Um, but, you know, put your lunch dish away you know, show me where your dish goes, right? So they might point over wherever it is. So you know they've got it. Um, you can also break down tasks into smaller steps. If you know that a child struggles when you say, it's time to go outside, let's get our coats and our boots on and, and stand by the door. You know, those are a lot of directions. Can you give them one at a time so that he can be successful. Um, so that might have to happen too. A shift in, in how many tasks you give them at once. Always slow yourself down, right? Allow more time for that child to take it in, figure it out and either respond or, or provide an action. Um, some of the language we use is very strange. You know, we have idioms and sayings that it makes sense to all of us because we grew up with them, they, they're logical. But to a brain that processes information differently, if I say, gee, that cost an arm and a leg, you know, they might take that really literally, or it, it's raining cats and dogs out there, you know? What does that mean to a child who takes everything literally? Um, so really be careful about um, your words. A funny story for you. I, I hope you don't mind a little. Um, I did a practicum at my university with Robert Munch, and I'm sure you all know Robert Munch. He was brilliant with children, and, and I did a toddler practicum with him. And um, I learned so much from Robert Munch. One of the things he used to do when a, a parent dropped off a toddler and they were upset and crying, he would say, he would pick them up and say, oh, it's, a, I know you're so sad. You know, he would just reiterate that. Um, but then instead of saying something like, um, you know, let, you know, they're messy, you know, there were tears and there was snot. It was all a disaster, right? He wouldn't just say, let me wipe your nose. He would say, you've got snot running down your face. Let's, let's wash that, <laughs> you know, like he would describe it and and use language that they understood and, and so it was it was really interesting <laughs> um consistency um is key so you know if it's consistent language or consistent um place where they sit and do do a task um but if you if everyone all the adults in the room say walk inside 
he'll get that or she'll get that, right? That'll become normal. But if they all say it in a different way, it's going to be harder to process. So using that consistent language, using consistent routines. And, and again, visual supports can help here, right? If you've got uh, a sink where they wash their hands and have some beautiful pictures right in front where they can see, where they know they need soap, they need water, they turn the tap off. So all of those pictures can help them to be um, successful and to process, what do I need to do first, right? Excuse me. Um, and I think I've covered all that stuff so we can move on. We have about um, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. Bev, so we both have to, I guess, speed it up a little bit. Yeah. That's the challenge when you're trying to give an overview. Yeah. So processing information involves memory. We store the information in a number of ways, you know, using our senses, our working memory, our long-term memory. And I'd mentioned earlier, it's kind of like a filing cabinet. You know, most of us are able to file the information away rather neatly so we can uh, retrieve it. But uh, children with FASD, the information may just kind of feel like it's more haphazardly sorted. Mm -hmm. uh, so they struggle with memory. And this, these struggles are the result of structural changes to the brain. So children with FASD of a brain, the brain works, you know, they can have, you know, the above average intelligence and everything, but the brain is working differently. And that's one of the keys to remember as well. And the struggles they're having because of the structural changes to the brain are causing them challenges in the classroom and in so many other ways, and definitely with memory. So it's not always easy to find the memory. And as a result, some of the challenges can be that inconsistent memory that I mentioned a little earlier. That generalization, I know to do it here, I don't necessarily know to do it there. Uh, another one that is a major challenge uh, is, it's called confabulation. Other people call it, or many people will call it lying. And confabulation is not a lie. It is not a child willingly telling you something in order to get away with something or because they don't want to take responsibility. It's because of the memory impact of the prenatal alcohol exposure. So we may ask the child, you know, what happened to that pencil that was on your desk? The child may not know. The child may not remember. So the child may give you some amazing story about what happened to the pencil. But that can be because of some of the inconsistent memories that are there. Maybe the child saw um, a TV show and something happened with a pencil that it was broken, thrown away or whatever. Or maybe, you know, they were told a story about a pencil. And so they may have all these little bits of memory that are related to the topic at hand, but they're not what really happened. And so the child is doing the best. The child's trying to give you an answer. The memory's not allowing the child to give you the answer. That is, you know, what really happened. And as a result, many children are accused of being liars. And that is a really strong negative word. And it's really not fair to the child because the child is not doing it on purpose. So it's confabulation. It's because of the memory and they're trying to fill in the blanks. It's like when you're doing those puzzles, you try to fill in the blank and you're using a whole bunch of different, you know, words or ways to fill in the blank until you can find the right one. Well, the child is filling in the blanks and sometimes what's coming up from the memory is not the right answer. And so I'm going to pass it on to you, Bev. Thank you. Um, so lots of strategies to support memory, uh, and some of them we've used in other, there's lots of repetition here. Um, yeah. So some of the strategies fit with information processing and memory and executive functioning, right? The re repetition, visuals. Um, you can use reminders and prompts to support a child's memory. Um, yes, the, the dish goes in the and you're pointing and looking at it, right? So they have an opportunity to be successful. Um, using those consistent messages, I already mentioned that one, and routines. The more a child can touch and explore again, 
um, here helps their memory because we have some, one of our types of memories we have is called a sensory memory. So we we sense something and we remember. We you know you you can smell a smell when you think about your mom's pie or you know th those sensory memories are are very strong, and so helping to build some of those for kids can make a difference in their memory. They may need more time to practice and to learn new tasks. So for for one child, you know, it's uh, they've got the task mastered in a couple attempts. And for this child with FASD, they might need 40 tries to get it, you know, but, but they can get it. Um, this picture in the right corner is taken at an Aboriginal Head Start site. And uh, there's, it's hard to see, but there's some um, little pictures of dress up people on that shelf. And it really helped to um, help the kids find where the dress up clothes were and then be successful in cleaning up as well. So those, um, those um, prompts, those visuals, can make a difference. And you can deliberately teach, um, Martine talked about confabulation, not understanding ownership. You can deliberately teach, this belongs to this person and this belongs to you. And it, it'll take a lot and it'll take repetition again, but they can get that. And, and there are some strategies for that. I, I don't think I can get into various ones yeah. at this point, but no. So we'll move on. Sorry. That's okay. We should have planned for two hours. <laughs> yes. Social skills. Children develop social skills over time as they mature and as they practice getting along with others. But children with FASD can have challenges with social skills as well. It may be because they're getting into somebody else's space. They don't understand that concept of we seem to like a little bit of space around us. Uh, a child may hit somebody um, and may hit harder. Um, not that the child should be hitting in the first place, but maybe um, he just meant to say, touch somebody on the arm, but accidentally really slaps a person on the arm. That is related to say sensory issues may not understand uh, touch and how strong the touch is, but it certainly creates challenges in the social skill area doesn't understand social boundaries. It's a very abstract thing when we talk about um, social skills and, and what are boundaries and what are things we should and shouldn't do. And children with FASD can have huge challenges when they're dealing with things that are abstract, that are not concrete. So taking time to explain, and Bev will talk about that. They may take toys and belongings because of not understanding ownership. Once again, that generalization they're not always necessarily able to read facial cues. A lot of times when we're communicating, we can tell a lot about what is being said by a person's face, how the person is standing, plus what the person is saying, and also the tone of voice. Children with FASD may not be able to do that. And so that poses a big problem when they're trying to make friends or be with other people. And it also can make it difficult if they're wanting to say show empathy because they may not necessarily understand what is happening, what understand what the other person is thinking and feeling. Because once again, that can be quite abstract. So it can pose quite a challenge. And they're not trying to be difficult children. They're not trying to be hard to get along with. But because of so many of the things that are happening with executive functioning and language and sensory, they're having problems with the social skills. And they might stare at people and say very inappropriate things. And it's not that once again, they're trying to be bad. It's because of what they're dealing with, what they're living with. Yeah. But as, um, as care providers, uh, we can teach children to play with others. We can model we can demonstrate, we can show, and we can be there as a support while they learn it and, and help them to be successful. Um, the, the, during my master's degree, I worked as an assistantship in a preschool and uh, my job was to support children with disabilities 
to play successfully with others. So there, there were some children with FASD for sure. So I would take them into, for example, the housekeeping area in the daycare and teach them all about what was there and support them to do some behaviors that were appropriate in there. If it was a letter carrier station where people could put mail in the mailbox, et cetera, I would go through all that with them and practice. And then I'd bring in one child and, and support it with one child. And then after a time, they could just be sort of let loose in there and, and be successful. Um, those positive, simple rules can be very, um, very helpful. Uh, just, you know, it's not a complex kind of system of, of getting along socially, right? It's uh, you decide on what rules are most important and you uh, consistently um, enforce those gently and calmly. Um, talking out loud can really help. Talk about peer behavior. You know, someone's had a fall. Oh my goodness, she's crying. She must be hurt right? Teach them how to empathize. Teach them what that other person might be feeling or experiencing. Um, and then teaching boundaries, right? It's that, as you said, Marlene, that invisible boundary uh, of social space that we all require in our, in our culture. Um, sometimes you can bring uh, small mats to a group time and each child sits on one small mat and eventually, um, it may be a struggle at first, but eventually they'll understand that that's where I belong and, and that's his mat and he's over there. Um, and you know, sometimes it's just avoid those really big groups because they will never work. If, if it's a child who is overstimulated, um, can you do something different? If there's a large circle, um, can that child sit on an adult's knee? Can they face away from the group? Is, is there something you can do to make it successful for them? Um, and social stories can be really helpful too. And there's an example here on the screen. Um, and if you're interested, just Google social stories and, and there'll be some great examples, but it really is just a story that helps teach that child how to interact, how to be a friend, how to deal with anger, all kinds of issues. Thank you. Emotional regulation. That means being able to name your emotions, control your emotions, and show your emotions in a healthy way. And all children have to learn or need to learn emotional regulation. But children with FASD may struggle more with this on their journeys. And they may need support in order to bring themselves down if they have had challenges or had an emotional outburst or lost control. But it's important to remember, there are no bad emotions. There may be emotions we don't necessarily like dealing with, but there are no bad emotions. We have to learn how to decrease their intensity and help the child uh, find another way of showing a response to a situation. It's okay for the child to feel anger, but they may need support in how to show anger appropriately. Breaking somebody's toy is not the way, but you know, saying I'm mad is better. So they may have tantrums, they may zone out, they may fight with others. They may have uncontrolled laughter because something has struck them as um, funny, but it doesn't necessarily fit the uh, situation. They may become overexcited. And it's your turn, Bev, as soon as I get there. Okay, so certainly there needs to be some places where they can take that big emotion and calm it down, right? Some places around that they can go off by themselves um, or maybe with one other person and just calm down, not as a time out, but as a time away, time away to sort of settle themselves. Uh, and you can show and model those calming behaviors as well, you know, model that, oh my goodness, I'm getting upset. I think I'm just gonna go over here and uh, take some deep breaths, right? So modeling that for them as well. Um, sometimes children will, will need some deep pressure, you know, maybe um, giving them a little back rub if that's right for that kid. Maybe some heavy work. Um, maybe sweeping the floor, maybe carrying a heavy backpack, 
will help them to calm down. Um, some music can, can make a difference, especially some nice calming music. You know, what does that music sound like? Let's move our bodies with that, right? So making your body feel calm and, and making it work. Teaching children about emotions so that they can label the emotions, figure them out, um, you know, having, having those faces around, using puppets, whatever it may be. And really uh, supporting them when you know things will be difficult. Um, you can help them to regulate their emotions with the goal of them regulating them for themselves at some point. Um, so can you change something in the environment that's, that's an easy fix to help them be successful? Okay. Uh, we have four minutes, Bev. So, so we I kind of talked about language. So I'm just going to skip past it because you've made okay. some references to it. But I felt it was really important to talk about uh, sensory integration because sensory issues are really significant for children with FASD. Okay. And so as Bev is talking about um, strategies, I'm just going to encourage those of you who are taking part to sit very still and not move at all. I don't want you to tap a finger, touch your ear, tap your toe or anything. Good luck. Okay, um, so some of these I've already been strategies in other places, right? Reduce visual distractions. If you want them to concentrate on something, you have to help them to close off all those senses that they don't need. So consider the colors in your space. Um, you know, if you've got a red wall over here and a green wall over here, maybe it's overkill and maybe you need to actually paint. Maybe you need to take down a whole bunch of stuff that's on the wall. Maybe you need to cover some shelves that are open uh, with a little curtain or, or can you actually get some shelves with doors so that they're closed? Consider clothing that the child wears or the um, mat they're sitting on. Is it too much for them? Uh, the pictures here are, are quite lovely. The one on top, the center is one of the Aboriginal Head Start centers here in Saskatchewan. They took, um, they ripped a hole in all those lovely big stuffies and they put some heavy weighted things inside them and had them right beside the circle mat so that any kid who wanted could take one of those heavy stuffies and put it on their lap. So it was a sensory strategy that really supported a child with FASD to sit still and, and succeed. So it was excellent. There's also fidgets and the other picture is headphones. Can you provide a space in the room where if they just can't stand it anymore, they can go put on some noise cancelling headphones and maybe listen to some quiet music or do a couple deep breaths. Um, there's many ways to support them to calm themselves. And always make sure that it's not seen as a punishment. Yes. You know, you're feeling rather upset. Would it help if you went and sat in the tent? Because sometimes you can have a little tent or a covered place where they can go that's quiet. Yeah. But as long as it's not seen as a punishment. Uh, another one I just really want to share is uh, I saw one center where they had tennis balls put on the feet of all the chairs in the room so that you didn't hear any of that horrible scratching when people dragged chairs. They were silent as could be. It was beautiful. And think about the clothing. Are their socks bothering them, the tags and the clothing? Sometimes it can be the clothing that's causing them to do a lot of the fidgeting. So wanted to make sure we had a chance to maybe use this as part of our closing, Bev. Um, yeah. And I'll let you just chat about the chart. Sure. Um, you know, I think many of you are familiar with Diane Melvin's work. You know, if we think a child won't do that. We think of them as willful, right? If we think, well, they have FASD and they can't do it. Well, so then you might not expect too much and you might actually kind of give up trying. What we challenge you to do is to think they can do that, but differently. So what supports or strategies or accommodations can you put in place to support them to be successful? 
they can do anything but differently perhaps right with with something to support them so i'm not going to go through the uh, the the individual pieces there i think they're they're self self explanatory um, but think differently and think success every child can succeed and they need our help to do it so create a predictable day right marlene do you want to chat to that and this just kind of refers back to many of the things that we've already talked about. Setting up routines so the child knows what's happening. Schedules. Mm -hmm. Build habits with them. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Even though it may drive you insane, it's building up success for the child. It's how we learn. It's by repetition. Consistency. When you see something that works, keep trying it. And then if one day it doesn't work, it might be because of that inconsistency that they may have with their memories. Success for children with FASD happens because their environment is structured in a way that supports them. Mm -hmm. So rather than trying to have a child fit into, you know, a, I don't want to say square peg and round hole, even though I just did, but, you know, we're all different. What works for one is not going to work for the other. Expecting a child with FASD to be able to cope with the noise and the chaos and, and so many of the other things that we may see as typical and fine in say our, our homes or our daycares or our schools is setting a child up for challenges. So look at how we can support, use some of these ideas and there are places where you can uh, get more information and those are on the PowerPoint that you have uh, that just gives you that little bit of extra information. If you have any more that you would like from us, here is our contact information. You can find stuff on our website as well. I Anyone would like has a question oh. that they want to put in the chat. I'm sorry, Marlene. No, that's that's actually great. We know that we said it would be an hour. We yep. know it's a little over an hour. Many of you have to leave. If some of you wish to stay, want to stay, we're quite happy to stay on longer and chat further. But for those who have to leave, thank you. I will be sending you an evaluation survey that really helps us with the work that we do. Thank you for your interest in this and thanks for wanting to make a difference for children. Thank you.